And a big, big warm welcome, my friends, back for another Mr. Dilly Meets. It's great to have you with us again. If you're joining us for the first time, uh, get ready for some uh, inspiration, creativity, some laughter, learning, uh, fun, joy, all the good stuff in life. Uh, today, uh, it's very exciting. I've got some, some lovely guests for you today, as usual. Um, now, the last Mr. Dilly Meets was back in uh, early February. Now, we had Jill Lewis and Gillian Cross on that show. If you haven't seen that one, you can do check it out on the Mr. Dilly YouTube channel. Uh, all the Mr. Dilly Meeks are up there for you to have a look at, as well as some free history content and other literacy content to get you all inspired and to use in your classrooms. Uh, teachers, if you do go on there, do uh, do try and subscribe. It all keeps, it keeps this stuff free and also spreads it to other schools across the UK and uh, beyond as well. So do check that out. So what delights do we have for you, my friends, today? Well, we're going to cover both key stages today. I know we get a, a wide uh, width of audiences on Mr. Dilly Meeks anyway. Uh, but we specifically, we're going to be doing Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2. But all the content is suitable for, for all children to watch today. So uh, very, very excited to, uh, to, uh, to see uh, what the inspiration that our, our guests can give you today uh, across all ages at your school. So what have we got coming up today, my friends? Well, today we have two author illustrators, authors and illustrators. Uh, they've had books published by themselves and they've also worked together a very successful partnership since about, I think about 2013. Um, I will try and give you a few clues and then we'll have a look. Uh, who am I talking about? His first novel, I believe, was published in 2001 and it is Mortal Engines. Since then, he's gone on to publish, I think, three sequels, three prequels to those books, as well as lots of other series. Um, a few years ago, he, he published the first of a new series, uh, Utterly Dark. I think it was Utterly Dark and uh, he's back now with Utterly Dark and The Heart of the Wild, which was published towards the end of last year. Who am I talking about, people? Well, we're talking about none other than Mr. Philip Reeve. So, hands together, Mr. Philip Reeve, who's coming up later on the show. Very, very excited. Now, in 2013, as I said, Philip was joined uh, joined forces by uh, another author illustrator, the wonderful hat wearer extraordinaire. Uh, and as you can see, I love a hat. I love a hat myself. Uh, it was wonderful. The uh, Their first book, I think, was Oliver in the Seaweed. They worked together on the uh, Roly Poly Flying Pony series. And they are back uh, with a new book published next month, Adventure Mice, Otter Chaos. So we'll be meeting the brilliant Sarah McIntyre as well later on. And uh, also, they will be both together towards the end of the show where they'll be talking more about Adventure Mice. And also, there'll be a quiz there, a kind of an adventure children's book quiz for you all to join in with. So do um, make sure you uh, get into sort of maybe teams if you want to, or you can play on your own or in pairs, whatever works for you. Uh, as well as that, we have, uh, you may remember this man, the wonderful Jonathan Pumple from the Dirigible Blue, the, the fantastic children's poetry website. Uh, Jonathan was our poetry in residence on Mr. Diddy Meets for quite a few months, uh, I think last year. And he's back now talking about uh, the anthology they've published, Chasing Clouds, which contains all kinds of wonderful works from uh, famous poets and uh, not lesser known poets as well. And he'll be back to talk about that as well. So a packed show. We also have a draw along from Sarah McIntyre. So make sure you've got some paper and some uh, pencils ready for that. So shall we welcome my first guest? I think we should welcome our first guest. Put your hands together across the country. He's a wonderful man, fantastic writer. Put your hands together for Mr. Philip Reeve. Philip, lovely to see you, sir. How Hello. are you? How's things? Very well, thank you. Yes, thank you for having me on. Good well, no, it's absolutely a pleasure, absolutely a pleasure to be on today. Um, big fan of your, uh, your, your books. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about, obviously, uh, well, your work and, and uh, mm -hmm. your, your latest uh, books as well, and your collaboration with Sarah a little bit as well. But for yes. those of you who aren't familiar with uh, yourself or maybe your work, could you tell them a little bit about about that, about your books and kind of uh, how you got from sort of here to there, if, if I may? Uh, yeah. I'll hand over to you and there we go. Well, I, I um, started out as an illustrator. I went to art college and, and became a, a sort of jobbing illustrator, drawing pictures for magazines and things. And eventually I started drawing pictures for the Horrible Histories series and sort of similar books that were being published back in the 1990s. Um, but I was also, I was always writing as a hobby as well. I'd always written stories since I was tiny. So um, eventually I, I finished one that um, I got published called Mortal Engines, which was my first book, which is a sort of big science fiction adventure story set in the future when cities um, move around on giant caterpillar tracks and, and eat each other. 
um, by you know they sort of tear each other apart for raw materials and things. So it's it's quite a it's a city city world, and um, that that led to a sort of four a, a quartet of books that had three three sequels and some prequels. So that kept me busy for a while, and then I branched out and did other things. I did another another science fiction series, Railhead, um, which is much more sort of spacey and futuristic, and um, and then lately I've been working on on these books, Utterly Dark, and uh, they're set. They're they're quite different. They're sort of slightly magical. They're set in um, set in the eighteen hundreds on a on a on an island, an imaginary island I've made up somewhere off the western coast of Britain. And um, this island kind of butts up against regions where ancient magic and uh, mysterious goings on still happen. So it's sort of sort of like a historical story, but it's also very fantasy. But that's one. That's one of the best uh, children's books, and it's always it, it is where it's it's this world, but it's kind of n not this world, you know, sort of right on the edge of this world, you know. Yeah, I, I, I guess all my all my all my books are like that to some extent. I sort of yeah. like I like to kind of keep one foot in reality. Um, so in Mortal Engines, the big cities that zoom, the big city that zooms around eating other cities is London, and it's still got all sort of familiar yeah. London place names. Well, actually, it's actually interesting because like, that's one of the things uh, I was actually going to ask you about. Is uh, and it, I know it's often been said about your. <clears throat> your your novels is the the worlds you create are so um so vivid they're so strong you you can imagine them as the world that you're you're in but there's also a lot of stuff that obviously you can watch uh, shows and there's sometimes other books where you don't quite believe the world and, and one of the things I, I love about uh, your books and about any any good stories i guess is that you you have to ground the characters in a sort of in, in a reality you know you have to make them as human as possible so you believe <laughs> the dilemmas the the characters kind of face and then you sort of believe the world don't you uh kind of more what are you any advice for sort of children watching that you know that because i know when my son uh used to write certainly when he was younger it got straight into the action you know bash back to him someone would you know die or something whatever would happen like this but you didn't know about the characters so mm. you weren't kind of sort of invested in it you got any advice for the children watching of what basically if they were to write a little story uh similar maybe to yours uh how they could sort of ground those characters and how they could think about them a little well, bit i think um i think going straight into the action is actually quite a good quite good advice i think your son was doing it right to start with something really exciting happening um and it doesn't really matter if you don't understand who anybody don't know who anybody is or or if the world seems really weird um as long as quite quickly after that you kind of explain what's happening um so I, I think it yeah it sort of hooks people in if you start quite if you think about like films and tv shows and things quite often you start off with a scene which is all action and mystery and you don't really know what's happening or what's going on and then it explains it and that's a lot more exciting a lot more uh interesting than if you kind of carefully explain everything and then get to the action. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people will have zoned out by the time you get to that so absolutely. you know it's, it's a good idea to start with some action but then after a couple of pages you know you need to and i think you i think you just there isn't really a firm rule to this you just develop a feeling for when when you need to start explaining stuff yeah yeah absolutely absolutely but some of the questions we're going to ask you in a moment actually were sort of uh uh, give you a sort of clue to that and how people uh you know sort of approached your books and children are, are watching it and uh and all the stuff but your your work your works are, they, are, they are incredible uh, imagination um for me uh i guess i was asking is that how you know what was your and i'm sure you can ask a lot this what was your kind of inspiration to sort of a start writing but also to sort of go that direction with the sort of the, that sort of world creating you know, so, so a lot of books, some books are just obviously set in this world and they're comedies, but these are these are such huge kind of and completely separate worlds uh, that you create. Um, what was your kind of inspiration to sort of get in, get into both of those things, the writing and the create that sort of world creation part? Um, I, well, I, I think writing, I've just, I've always done it for as long as I can remember. So I'm not sure what led to that. I think I just liked, I liked stories, you know, I like I liked books and I liked television and I liked comics and films when I could get to the cinema when I was little. So um, I just liked stories and, and I wanted to make my own. Um, and then the world creation thing, I think I was very inspired by C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, um, who I discovered. I think C.S. Lewis, I must have had read to me when I was about seven and then probably Lord of the Rings a year or so later. Um, and both of those uh, were kind of quite they were kind of revelations to me because I suddenly realized, oh, you don't have to set your stories in the real world. You can make up a world. Yeah. And um, yes, yeah, certainly uh, Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, and, and the Hobbit. Um, that, yeah, we, I just read them the other day. Actually. 
yeah. So oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Layers and layers and layers of detail um, for me is what makes a world feel real. Well, there is. I mean, when you read, uh, this is for the older kids, really, if you've had a go at reading Lord of the Rings, because uh, I, I literally just read it again, uh, some of it uh, again recently. There is, the, the, the descriptive parts are, I mean, they're incredible, the imagination, but they, they go off for several pages on, on a long a long tangent and stuff but but it really does make you believe believe the whole the whole world and i and i think a lot of authors have been really influenced by lord of the rings and the hobbit and i remember the hobbit as a child as well which is just such a wonderful a wonderful magical book for those children who haven't actually read it you give it a go it's it's a it's a great book i feel like we've got uh quite a few questions for you i don't know if we get through all of them but we we put them up there and uh, we'll see uh see how we go so the first one up here is uh from holgate primary school in nottingham what helps you to create such amazing characters and where do you get your ideas from? We sort of covered a little bit already of that, but I'll hand over to you anyway. Um, thing is, I don't really know, you know, where the ideas come from. They just come, kind of come from anywhere, everywhere. You know, I kind of read and watch telly and walk about and talk to people and watch the news and stuff. And always ideas are coming in and eventually they'll kind of turn into other ideas and something new will come out. So it's kind of a bit of a mysterious process, really. You can't kind of force it. Um, and then as for the characters, again, I'm not entirely sure. The characters tend to come out of the worlds of the stories. You know, I, I, I you know, I start writing a, a story about, you know, I start writing a story about this sort of mysterious island and somebody needs to live there. Uh, so I invented Utterly Dark, who's this young girl who, who, who lives there. And, um, and then she needs to do something and there needs to be some reason why there's a big story around her. So you start to think, OK, there's something a bit mysterious about her, too. So do you have any sort of set, because I, I was talking to when I was talking to on last month's show, I was talking to Jill Lewis and she um, she said she started visually in the sense that not that I don't think she's necessarily an artist, but she used to sort of see her characters and draw them. And once she could sort of see them, they, they were great starting points for, uh, for, for her books. And then we spoke about um well, just repeating what I said last week, sorry, but uh, Ransom Riggs, who did the Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, who start to, started those books with just a load of old photographs and they and then sort of thought of the characters around those photographs. Do you have any particular process or is it just literally just whatever? Yeah. Comes um, away? Well, I can I can sort of see the worlds and the places very, very clearly, um, you know, absolutely vividly, like, like I'm watching a movie. But um, the characters, I really can't, I, I don't see them at all. I couldn't I couldn't sit down and draw you a picture of them. Um, or I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be satisfied with it if I did. Um, I, 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 uh, I kind of start with a name usually. I like inventing names and you invent a name like Utterly Dark and then you think, well, who is she and what's she like? Um, and I, I did slightly, because Utterly is about 11 when the book starts and the only child of that age I know at the moment is uh, my little niece, Aretha. So I slightly based it on her visually but then of course she isn't really based and Aretha's quite sort of a bright kind of quite funny curious person so um so I think a little bit of that has gone into utterly um but I don't normally base characters on on real people yeah. it's, um, it's, 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 fasc it's just fascinating I think I think they do, the, the way we will get into stuff and I think it's kind of really encouraging for children to listen to because obviously they can you know literally use their imaginations of how they want to start anything and which is obviously mm -hmm. no sort of set path to do it um so that's that's really really interesting okay let's go if you oh here's a good one um st joseph the work is called Salford. if you had to live in one of your books which book would you choose that's a great question that's a great question. um well you know utterly dark i really like i like the island where utterly lives it's uh it's it's lovely and it's full of nice people who i'd quite like to spend time with and she lives in a nice house on the cliffs but you know it's kind of 1810 or something so you have to worry about uh, you know, where do you get your teeth done if you have toothache, that kind of stuff? There's no dentists. It would be terrible. So um, I think the world I'd most like to live in is probably Railhead, which is a sort of a kind of a future that works. And it doesn't always work for the hero, Zen, who's having a terrible time and being chased around by people um, and stuff like that. But uh, it's basically a kind of a huge sprawling galactic empire linked by hyperspace railway trains. And um, you can kind of go anywhere and do anything, and there's beautiful worlds to explore. So this would be this would be the one to live in. So railhead, railhead would be the one to live in, which, which yeah. is fantastic. Okay, let's let's go. Let's try and we can get a quick a couple more. And I know you're going to do a, a reading from us, um, and maybe mm. just tell us a little bit more about Utterly Dark in a moment, just about where we find Utterly in this this second book, which would be great. So let's just cover a couple more questions. Um, we want to cover that. Oh, here we go. Let's follow this. Um, this is a good one. Here we go. St. John the Baptist School in where? If you were on a desert island, 
and could only bring one children's book, which book would you bring and why? That's a tricky one, isn't it? Lots of good ones. Depends on your mood, really. Uh, but I would, I, I would bring The Lord of the Rings, which I think is a children's book. It's also an adult's book. But, um, you know, it's it's a book I kind of go back and read every 10 years or something at least. And uh, I think I could probably, that will probably keep me going for a long time. Uh, but it's huge as well. It's really good. It's so, huge. And you can use it for all sorts of things, a pillow. You can yeah. use it, you know, standing up just to get higher up onto maybe a tree if you need to collect the coconut from a tree That's or something. Lovely, Lord yeah. of the Rings has got many purposes, which is, which is good. But also, obviously, all the languages in there and all kinds of stuff, isn't it? So, yes, you said you can you can let the imagination run run right with that thing. Mm. Uh, okay, um, let's uh, – one more quick question, and then we will uh, come back to you, Pro Atta Dark, and tell us a bit more about it and, and a reading from that. So this is – I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right – Ben Gio or Ben Gio Primary School in, in Hartford. How do you overcome writer's block? I guess that's, that's if you've ever ever had it at all. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess well, probably all writers get – times when they're stuck you know you don't know what to do next um and you just i mean sometimes you just have to wait for it to pass um the other thing that happens quite often i find that i kind of beaver away all day and and sort of um bang my head against the brick wall and don't really produce anything that i like and then when i stop um and i'm sort of like doing the washing up in the evening or something suddenly because i'm not thinking about it suddenly you understand how the problem can be solved so quite often the way to get around writer's block is to stop writing for a bit and do something else and then your subconscious mind will come up with the answers that's really fascinating that is very true that is i saw a talk once and this is for the children as well when you're about being bored i think it was and it was basically saying being bored sometimes is a really good thing because your brain sort of relaxes and a bit like you were saying, well, you're doing something mundane that's not very exciting. And you sell like washing up or ironing or whatever. Um, I don't know how many kids have washed up and ironed, but we get the idea. Um, and uh, and then it kind of opens itself up to these sort of things popping inside it. So it's really kind of fascinating to sort of uh, sometimes, you know, just to not have that stimulation and just kind of let ideas come and come and go in, in that sense. So that's that's really interesting. Now we're going to hand over to Philip now. Uh, Philip's going to read uh, from, uh, tell us a little bit more about Utterly Dark uh, and where we find um the uh, the character in this particular second uh, novel in this uh, story and uh, then do a short reading from it so i'll hand over to you philip okay back with you okay um well uh, utterly dark the first book utterly dark lives on a remote island called wild sea and the first book is very much concerned with the sea itself the, the sea that washes the shores of wild sea is sort of haunted there's a mysterious being who lives offshore called the gorm and strange islands that appear and disappear out in the mists and things so the first book is all about exploring those mysteries and utterly learns various things about herself um but uh, but then the second book of course i didn't want to just repeat myself but luckily wild sea is just one of a whole group of islands so i just had us to go off to another island and it's a it's a bigger island than wild sea so she can get well away from the coast and there she can have land-based adventures and um, i must confess i thought i was going to be reading for the first one so it's going to take me a second or two just to um find the piece to read but i will find it um sorry about this There we go. So at this point, Utterly and her, her uncle Will and her young friend Egg are exploring. Uh, they, they've been invited to the island of Summer Summertide to, um, to investigate some mysterious old stone circles and burial mounds and things which uh, the local landowner thinks might be of, you know, sort of archaeological value. Um, and they got lost in the fog and uh, in the fog, they're, they're looking for they're looking for shelter at the local the local rectory, and uh, they don't find it. Of course, they did not reach the rectory, for as they climbed uphill towards the church, the ghostly grey antlers of the Barrow Church oak appeared out of the whiteness above them, and utterly knew suddenly that this was where they had been going all along. The trees' branches seemed to be reaching out through the fog like gaunt hands waiting to grasp them, and from somewhere beneath it, a golden light shone out like lamplight from an open door. They picked their way across the slippery lattice of roots and stood gaping in astonishment. At the base of the oak's trunk, a doorway had appeared. It was as if the massive old roots had been drawn aside, revealing two upright stones with a lintel balanced across them and an opening between. Out of this opening shone the golden light, the soft gold of evening sunlight in a summer wood, filtered through layer upon layer of leaves. Oh, said Utterly, this was not here yesterday, not a sign of it. Look! 
There is the scorch mark on the tree. This hole has opened right where I was standing, but I'm sure it was only roots yesterday. A landslip must have exposed it, said Will. Or more blooming magic, said Egg. How can there be sunshine on the inside of a hill, especially when we can't see our hands in front of our faces out here? Will scrambled closer. He ran his hands over the stones, tracing the curves and spirals of ancient carvings half erased by time. He ducked into the opening so that his body blocked out most of the light. What can you see? called Utterly. Will did not answer, so she clambered up the roots to join him. A smell was coming from the opening. Not the musty, dusty smell you would expect inside a burial chamber, but a rich scent of growing things. Uncle Will heard Utterly behind him in the doorway and looked back. Stay outside, Utterly. I'm not altogether sure. He seemed to lose track then of what he was saying, and his words tailed off as he walked further into the hillside. Utterly did not know what it was he was not altogether sure of, but she was not allowed about to let him venture into the old chamber alone. There was a sound coming from inside the hill now. To go with the light and the smell, it was a soft, steady sighing. Utterly felt sure that if she just went with Uncle Will a little way down that bright passageway, she would see the sea, which she had missed so much. She stepped forward, but before she could pass beneath the stone lintel, small, strong hands caught her from behind. Utterly, shouted Egg, you don't want to go meddling with whatever's in there. Let me go, exclaimed Utterly, struggling with him, until they slipped on the damp roots and fell, sliding together a yard or more down the slope. Let me go, Egg. Can't you hear it? Can't you see the light? I can, said Egg firmly, and I know there shouldn't be sunshine underground, nor sweet sounds neither. There's magic in there, Utterly. Wild magic or worse, and only a fool would stick his nose into it. Talking of which, he turned, meaning to shout, come out of there, Will Dark. But the words faded away before they could find their way out of his mouth. Utterly yelped with shock. In the seconds she had spent looking at Egg, Uncle Will had vanished, and the massive roots of the old oak seemed silently and swiftly to have woven themselves back in place, hiding the stone doorway entirely. Here we go, fantastic. Wonderful, wonderful. There, there you get more of that world creating stuff from Philip there. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. Now, Philip, we're going to be uh, speaking to you again later on uh, with Sarah. Um, just before we uh, before we do that and, and go on to uh, to speak to Sarah by herself, um, <clears throat> every month um, as the children watching, if you're regulars or if you're not, we have an artwork competition called Dilly's Doodles. Uh, and uh, in that, uh, children get to respond to uh, some of the, the wonderful stories the artists, uh, sorry, the authors bring in uh, with their artwork. Uh, so, um, Philip, in order to, for children, they could win, I think we got over here, um, they could win a, uh, a signed copy of both of your Utterly Dark books and also Adventure Mice, obviously, which we're talking about uh, later on. Do you have an artwork challenge you could set the children uh, to do for Utterly Dark uh, that they could send in their, their drawings? I'll hand over to you if you've got a little challenge. That'd be of course, yes. Well, um, as I was saying, Utterly Dark is set on, um, the first book is set on an island, Wild Sea. This is Paddy Donnelly, the illustrator, has, has done a, a map of it to go in the front. And um, this is how the book started, really. I sort of doodled a little scribble of this kind of back to front letter J shape and thought, that's an island. And I started putting in the towns and, you know, wondering who lived there and that kind of thing. So I think that's what I'd like you to do. I think I would like you to create an island and either just make up a shape or just find a shape. You know, I expect there's probably, you know, a stain on the classroom wall or, um, you know, if you like if you drop a tea bag or something like that, you get a kind of a splat, don't you? Just, just drop a tea bag, a wet tea bag on a piece of paper and draw a line around the um, the splat it makes. And that's your island. If you, you know, if you don't, if you haven't got a shape in mind. And um, and then when you've got your shape, your outline of your island, then start thinking, well, you know, are there mountains? Are there swamps? Is there a pirate treasure buried here? Is there a forest? Are there monsters? You know, create a world, give it a name. Um, and if you want more, you know, sort of more drawing than map making, then you can you can fill in all the details. You can have ships in the sea around it and dragons and whatever you want on there. But really what you're going to be doing is building a little world, a little sort of miniature world on one single island. I, think that's I always love, I love maps at the beginning of books. So there, there's a bit of talking for you, but that, I love the maps at the beginning of books. That's great. So I like that tea bag splat idea. There's going to be tea bags being splattered. That's, that's all over. a bit messy. I think you could also do it. You could also do it by you sort of drop some dry rice on a, on a piece of paper. Dry, 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 dry rice. No, the teachers can do it. Too, no. up involved. So, that's some, some random, a random shape. Random that we could do. That's fantastic. So 
draw draw your own uh, world creating or island creating map and fill it with all these wonderful places. And that's a, that's a Philip's um, artwork challenge for you for Dilly's Doodles. Um, so that's fantastic. Uh, if you want to uh, get your uh, artwork in, um, details are up here. And I'll show them again at the end. So it's Dilly Doodles artwork competition. When you're in signed copies of Philip and Sarah's book, send to Mr. Dilly Presents at gmail.com by the 31st of March, please. Subject line, Dilly's Doodles. There we go. Fantastic. So, uh, Philip, we'll be speaking to you again uh, later on. Delight to hear about Utterly Dark. I look forward to speaking to you with Sarah about Adventure Mice later on. But for now, let's put our hands together. Round of applause. Mr. Philip Reed, please. Thank you, Philip. Speak to you later on. Thank you. Last uh, month, uh, we had a Dilly's Doodles competition for um, Jill Lewis and uh, Gillian Cross. And uh, Jill's uh, was, I think, uh, to draw a pirate uh, rat, uh, kind of reflected in her book, uh, in the, her new book, Moonfight. Uh, also, uh, Gillian's was was to create a fantastic a breakfast making machine inspired by Ollie Spark and the exploding popcorn mystery. So let's have a quick look at the results, and then we're back with Philip. Bye bye. Yeah. Last month's Dilly Doodles artwork competition. Congratulations to Arthur from Year 4 at St. Union's Primary. A signed copy of Gillian Cross's Ollie Spark and the Exploding Popcorn Mysteries on its way to you for your fantastic breakfast inventing machine. And the winner of the Jill Lewis competition, a signed copy of Moonfight by Jill Lewis, is won by Sophia from Year 6 at St. Saviour's Primary School. Fantastic, wonderful drawing of the pirate rat. Congratulations to you both. So... Should we get straight into our um, straight into our next guest? I think we, we think we should. She's obviously um, worked uh, with Philip on many books over the years. Has also published her own book. She is an author. She's an illustrator. Uh, please uh, join me in uh, welcoming to uh, Mr. Dilly meets the wonder that is Sarah McIntyre. Hello, Hello. Sarah McIntyre. Philip has disappeared, and, and Sarah is back. So that's, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. How are you? How's things? I'm doing well, thanks. How are you? I'm really, really good. It's lovely to have you on the show. Uh, so we're going to be uh, talking a little bit about uh, Adventure Mice, uh, a tiny bit with you, and then more so when you're joined with Philip again a bit later on in, in the uh, in the show, if that's okay. Um, a couple of things. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with your work and maybe your previous work with Philip, could you sort of tell us a little bit about that? Uh, and then we'll talk a bit more about Adventure Mice, is that, if that's okay. Yeah, I mean, Philip and I met each other, and the first book um, we decided to do together, he sort of said, well, what do you want to draw? And I, when I was little, I really wanted to be a mermaid. And so we thought something with a mermaid in it. And we came up with the book, uh, I think it's over here. It's um, Oliver and the Sea Wigs. And it's full of crazy ideas. And um, we kind of were trying to find something to hold it together. Uh, and I was at a meeting of the, it was the Children's Writers and Illustrators Group, Sea Wig was the acronym. And I thought, I wonder what a sea wig would look like. I bet islands would want to create these crazy um, collections of things they put in their heads, like old ships and submarines and wrecks and things and make these amazing wigs. And so that's how we came up with the idea of the sea wigs. I even got my uh, uh, mermaid in who you can see looks suspiciously like me. Her name's Iris and she's got very poor vision. She has these pointy specks. So and she doesn't sing very well, which also might be me. So that's what we did. And we came up with lots of other books like Cakes in Space and more recently, The Legend of Kevin, which had lots of other books, Kevin the Biscuit Bandit and Kevin vs. the Unicorns. He's a roly-poly flying pony. And um, it's, it's kind of based on Dartmoor where we live. 
Uh, and it's also this one's got unicorns in it, and you can see lots of different unicorns. Just we like coming up with strange things to invent, and we, we just sort of brainstorm together. It's lots of fun. <laughs> That's an amazing thing. One of the things um, I, I came literally came across um, a talk that you did. Uh, I don't know when when the talk was, but it was a great a great talk, and it was. Um, and it was about embracing your mistakes, the mistakes that we make, but in relation, I guess, to life, but also to to drawing but and writing as well. Um, and it worked. So that I thought it was brilliant, by the way. So thank, thanks. For, I really, really enjoyed that. Um, you write about in that you say about, um, and this is the truth with anything, about creating a few bad books yeah. first of all, uh, before you get to the... The good books. Could you sort of, uh, and obviously it was a big talk, so obviously if you can kind of condense that down, what did you sort of mean by that? Because I like the idea when you sort of, you folded up the bit of paper and said, here's your here's your book. And Yeah, you know, and that was a TEDx talk, so people can look for it if they want. But um, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's the idea that like when you first, people say, oh, how do you get into making books? Do you write a lot? Do you draw a lot? And those are all good, but actually to make little books, like even just one piece of paper folded, is such good training because you learn how to make a front cover, a back cover, what's inside. And then when you make copies of it with just a photocopy or a printer, um, you learn how to sell it. Like you learn how to package it up, maybe convince people to buy it or swap it with your friends. And of course the first books won't be that great. And sometimes it's even fun to try to make them intentionally bad. Cause like if I, set myself a challenge like draw the worst horse I can possibly imagine and even maybe draw it on my left hand like a fist draw it like that it can actually look really fun and I think oh I quite like how that came out that's really ridiculous and good and then so you just keep making books maybe make them ridiculous funny put the stuff that your teachers wouldn't really want you to put in it like I don't know farts and anything um and just keep making books and they might be a little start out really bad and maybe the next book will be a little better next book might be a little better than that and next book might be pretty good and but you never would have got to the good books unless you'd started out with the bad books so yeah make lots of bad books and don't worry about it don't be too I, proud I, I, of I did I mean that I mean it's obviously a simple idea fold a bit of paper over and you've mm. as you said you've got, you've got a front cover a back cover and then you just got you can write that short story in there just to start start with that exactly. I, I love that as I love that as a thing as a thing and we've got some questions for you uh, Sarah and then we're going to um Speak very uh, briefly about Adventure Mice, and then we're going to go through a draw along uh, with Sarah. So have your pens and papers ready, uh, and then we'll be back with uh, Philip and Sarah talking more about the book uh, later on. So let's go to some questions uh, for you, Sarah. Here we go. So, um, <clears throat> Beach High Primary School, Hertfordshire. How does it feel when you hold your very own book for the first time? I'm guessing they mean the published book, not the bits of paper books How's it's that? amazing because when i when i'm drawing a book or painting it like there's all these bits of paper everywhere and scans and files and it's all kind of in pieces but then when it comes and the postman rings the bell and you open this box and you take out the books and it's all shiny and you kind of open it see if there's any mistakes and then you give it a sniff because new books smell really nice and it's just so exciting it's like i made this or we made this and it's just incredible. I have other books um, I do myself, like picture books. And again, like, look, it has shiny foil and like bright colors. And I just, oh, I love how it came out. Like the colors came out really well. And you never know, like if the yellows will be bright enough or what's going to happen. It always feel like that, even though obviously you've done it now quite a few times. Does it do, that, yeah. That's the moment of the book arriving and opening the box and seeing that that copy. Is it, <laughs> it must still be exciting, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, the second book just arrived and it was like, oh, Oh my goodness, the second book. So I have only one copy of it, so nobody's allowed yeah, to Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. That's, <laughs> that's great. Here we go. Here's a, here's a good one as well. Um, Greenmount Primary School, Year 5 in Greater Manchester. If you could tell your younger writing self anything, what mm -hmm. would it be? What I know exactly what this is because I used to read um, comics in the Seattle Times because I grew up in America. And I loved comics and I always wanted to be a cartoonist, except I couldn't think of the funny jokes to put at the end, like a really good quick joke. And then as I grew up, I realized you didn't have to make comics funny. You could make comics about like cooking or something sad that happened to you or just tell a story. It doesn't always have to have a quick, funny little joke in it. Just make it. And sometimes actually when you do that, the jokes will naturally happen because you'll start to like think, laugh at what you're doing and it, they come naturally. You just you don't have to think about it from the beginning. Just just start making stuff and it might be happy. It might be sad. It doesn't matter. It's just that starting, you know, sometimes that is the thing, and it's just starting something, and that can be really kind of this massive, massive kind of monolith on the horizon. How do I start? But all, all these ideas, like you, you're given, Philip gave 
uh, other authors are given. There's all these different ways in, and that's really, really fascinating for uh, for children to wait well, for all of us to hear. I don't think, I think even even adults, you know, just to sort of hear because we can get even worse as adults, can't we? Sort of thing. Oh, I definitely can't do that because I've had more years and definitely not been able to do that. And then you sort of find these ways in. It's wonderful. And so one more question, and then we're going to go over to the uh, talking about adventure mice in, in the drawing. Um, shall we ask you? Here we go. This was a. I suppose it kind of goes into what you just sort of said really but Secretary all saint c primary school in north yorkshire what would your advice be to someone who really wants to love reading but doesn't at the moment um that's okay i mean my sister didn't really start loving reading until she was in her 20s i think when she discovered lord of the rings suddenly it clicked for her that's okay i mean watch films um go to plays try other things and maybe it's just that you haven't found the right book yet you know it might not be that you want books about make-believe stories you might want to read like a book about how to fix your motorbike or a book about um of maps or something or you know there's there's so many different kinds of books out there and you just need to find what's right for you and it might not be what's right for your best friend or what your teacher says it could it could be something totally different and that's the wonderful thing about reading i i i used to do, do teaching here and there just um and there was this one boy he was a teenager actually so he'd be older than our audience watching he was 13 or 14 at the time he wasn't a big reader and he he's in the school library and uh, they had to choose a book to read. And he was like, oh, okay. I'm sure some people identify with that. And he, he just saw this book. He liked the cover of it. And he had a shield and a sword on it. And it was, uh, it was uh, I can't remember, was it um, Bernard, what's his name? Bernard Cornwell? Bournemouth? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, and uh, basically, he picked it up. And he thought, oh, I'll start reading it. And it was, a, it was a book from a series of books. And literally, he couldn't put it down. And he, I remember him telling me, and it, and it led to all kinds of things he did outside that. He went on to do sort of reenactment stuff and learn to play, learn uh, archery and all kinds of stuff just from this one book. Yeah. So if you can find it, and like anything else, just keep plowing through and eventually you'll find the thing that works for you. And, and it might just be the thing at the right time, at the right moment. You know, you need something, so you find the book about it. Yeah, yeah, and then, and then yeah. you find it. So it's brilliant. Okay, Sarah. So uh, we, we got loads of questions, but we, we can't we can't be with questions all day. So we're going to go uh, speak to you a little bit about uh, adventure mice uh, now. So obviously we're talking about it later on uh, with uh, when uh, John with Philip again. Uh, but can I just show? We've got some wonderful uh, drawings here of yours oh. uh, from adventure mice, and perhaps you just tell us a little bit about because this one is the is a, is showing the mice themselves. And their mouth and face. Um, um, you've got my logo over top of one of them. So what's going on here? Who, who, where do we find ourselves in Adventure Mice? What's the, give us a very brief outline and we can go into a bit more depth later on. Well, if you look, there's Pedro. He's the little yellow mouse. And he um, he gets washed to sea and rescued by Flader Mouse, the pilot mouse, who takes him to the mouse base where the Adventure Mice have their headquarters. And I liked drawing this cutaway section in the mouse space because you can see where they live. There's their sleeping nest and their kitchen and their, um, was it, table tennis room. And their, you can see there's even a little mouse going to the toilet and there's a little poo going down the, the toilet spout. <laughs> so I had a lot of fun designing that. <laughs> this is, this is the, it's a great picture. We've got, we've got another one here as well, which is, uh, I think, obviously further into the, into the book as well. Uh, so here's 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 some of the ideas that sort of the style of the book uh, and the artwork and uh, to that. I'll talk to you a bit more about that uh, with Philip, how that comes about in terms of the writing and the uh, mm -hmm. illustration uh, a bit later on, if I may, which would be fantastic. Um, you also have a draw along challenge based on Adventure Mice as well. So I'll hand over to you uh, for that. So once again, if you um, enter this, you can win your own uh, Adventure Mice challenge. And then obviously if you're doing the, the Philip Reeve uh, utterly dark you can win uh the philip reed books uh all signed copies uh your own signed copy so i'll hand over to sarah now she's going to set her own artwork challenge then we're going to go to sarah for her own draw along here we go so i'll hand over to you for the artwork challenge. so actually the artwork challenge is very similar to what philip came up with we both do books about islands and they're they're quite simple um sort of it's very fun to come up with an island and you can see in the back of the adventure mice book here's the the mouse islands and again, it's a map with, with lots of little places. You can see details and names and things. And just like that one, I want you to come up with your own island. And it might be full of little mice. It might be full of um, who, who lives on the island. So I want you to come up with one island at least and a picture of who lives on the island. Is it what kind of creature? And maybe give them a name. Because the whole thing is Pedro. He discovers the island. And because he doesn't know anything, you're kind of discovering along with him. So you're going to need some creature to discover the island with. And it might be a dragon. It might be, you know, a ghost. Who knows? It could be anything. 
so you just really had really that poetry. That's wonderful. That sort of world, we are world creation, which is so fascinating. Okay, if you if you do that once again, I'll repeat this: Dilly Doodles Art World Competition. Win your own signed copies of Philip and Sarah's books, and then Mister Dilly presents at gmail.com by the thirty first of March. Please, subject line: Dilly's Doodles. So, um, Sarah, we're going to hand over to you now for the uh, draw along. Thanks, Mister Dilly. Right to draw Pedro, I usually start with uh, his ear, so it's kind of a big C shape. So I want you to make. A big C like that on your paper. There you go. Right, when you finish that, we're going to make the hair that sticks up. So we're going to go one, two, three, like a big claw. Then I want you to do a straight line like that. And another line down, a bit like a wedge of cheese. Pedro would like that. Okay. Now we're going to do a line from the bottom of his ear to about there. And another one here. This is going to be his hoodie. So I've just made that line a bit longer. A line around here. And another one going up here. That'll give you time to catch up. So that's kind of a basic head shape. Now we're going to do the inside of his ear and it's kind of following the same line as before. So go another C like that. And then when you get to this bit, just a little hook there for the inside of his ear. And then we'll do his eyes. So I do two on the same side. One, two dots. And a bit of hair in his ear. Like that. And he needs some whiskers. One, two, three, four, and perhaps a little smile or a frown if he's upset. Okay, and then we're going to, let's start with his arm. So it comes out behind like that. And then a flat line like that for his cuff of his sleeve. And come up here like that. And then we're going to do a thumb. So one finger like that. And then three fingers. One, two, three. Okay. Now his other arm going up, he's going to be waving. So we're going to do a line like that. And another cuff line. And then come down, but don't quite touch the hood there. And just like before, we're going to have a thumb, so one finger, and then three. One, two, three. Now his body is a bit bell-shaped. It's like one line coming down here, and one line, it's going to kind of cut over that line, so like that. And then to give it that bell shape, we're going to do a sort of slightly rounded line around the bottom. And he's got a zip on his jacket, so a line that goes down like that. You might even want to put an extra lines just to show the inside of his jacket, like right there, because that could be a little bit white and that could be yellow. And same here. It's better when you're coloring in. Okay, now we're going to do his feet. So first one, let's go back and down. And then we'll do three little toes. One, two, three. And that will curve up and around, up to here. And then follow that other line like that. Okay, now we'll do the other foot. So like that, sort of an L shape almost. Three little toes, one, two, three, and then curve that around and follow that first line. Okay, now you've got the feet, so let's do the tail. So it's gonna, it's gonna go sort of behind this leg. So it comes up here and actually it can go any direction. I'll just have it curving around like that. And then when you've done that, make a point and follow that line back, but as you get toward his body, just make it a little bit wider, the tail. 
and it kind of disappears behind his leg there. And I like to put a few stripes in it, which then I can color with different shades of pink. So light pink, dark pink. And you can color this later if you want. And of course you don't have to color them like my pager. You could be your own little mouse. And let's do some shading. So to show he's kind of skipping along, let's put a shadow under him. But don't quite have it touching his foot because it makes him look like he's up in the air and a bit buoyant. So a little shadow line there. And he's got a spot around his eye. So we're going to draw with your pencil line there and just lightly on the side of your pencil a bit more. Kind of shade that in. Just like that. And maybe give some hairs. You might have some hairs on his legs too, or even a bit of shading down there. A bit of shading, some hairs. There you go. And his tuft of hair. That's a bit of shade. You could also use color, but I'm just gonna do it in black and white and shade it. And his, if you're coloring in his ears, they kind of start here and then go around like this. And of course, if you're painting this or coloring it, you can do inside his ears pink and then there's kind of a darker pink shadow in there if you want to add it. But you can look at the book to decide how to color if you want to color like Pedro. And there we go. There's a basic Pedro picture, maybe a little thing on his nose there. And finally, sign your name. So I'm going to sign Sarah McIntyre. But you sign your name because this is your picture. And there you go, little Pedro. Maybe he's really happy. Put some lines there. Okay, both uh, Philip and Sarah will be back later on. So fantastic, uh, the draw along there. I hope you enjoyed that and I look forward to seeing your entries. Do, uh, do send them in uh, and we will try and get some of those on next month's show as well. So uh, they will be back in about five or ten minutes, Philip and Sarah. We have uh, more chat about Adventure Mice as well as the quiz, I know, which I'm, I'm sure they're slightly terrified about, but I'm sure it's going to be a lot of fun, uh, and we'll do that at the end. But before we do that, um, we had Brian Moses last uh, last month on uh, Mr. Dilly's Poetry Picks. And uh, this month we have uh, a guest who's been on Mr. Dilly Meets many times before. So before I do that, let's get into Poetry Picks, and we speak to the man himself, just in <laughs> Yes, put your hands together. Welcome to Mr. Dilly Meets Poetry Picks, the fabulous Jonathan Humble there, sir. Hello, sir. It's, a, it's an absolute joy to have you back, sir. How are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, really, 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 really good. It's been it's been a long time. So if, if uh, children have watched before, you've been a, you've been a busy man with uh, children's poetry uh, for the last, what, about half a year now, I think, since you were last on. Uh, yeah, and we... you've got a wonderful, a wonderful anthology of all the books coming up. Can you tell us a little, little bit more about that? What's, what's that all about? Right. Well, uh, as folks might know or might not know, uh, I run the Dirigible Balloon website, uh, which is uh, down there below me. And on the Dirigible Balloon website, we have um, getting on for about a thousand poems and they're all really good quality stuff. Now, about six months into uh, uh, producing the website, uh, someone came up, one of the poets came up with the idea of doing an anthology. And uh, I thought, oh, well, that's a good idea, provided that the money that we make from uh, selling the anthology could go to uh, a charity, which is the uh, National Literacy Trust. So this last year, we've been uh, developing this poetry anthology, Chasing Clouds, uh, which came out last month, uh, well, two months ago. Uh, and uh, all proceeds, all profits from the uh, sales of Chasing Clouds will be going to the National Literacy Trust. And in this, poem, in this uh, poetry anthology, we've got 80 poems, from uh, about 60 poets, some very well known and some less well known. Um, and it's uh, to seeing the, the world through uh, the eyes of poets, basically. That must have been uh, hard to sort of narrow all that down. To. I mean, obviously, there's so many, so many poems. How did you how, how, many, how did you choose to sort of like, you know, the number that you ended up with? Obviously, a lot of that's to do with you can't have a book this thick. But I mean, how did you, how did you sort of choose that? Well, in the early days, when we first when it was first mooted, the idea of having the 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 anthology, we had about well, we had about 400, 500 poems uh, on the site. So now we've got about a thousand. We had four hundred, five hundred, 
and I went through them uh, and I tried to get a range. I got a, a range of poems uh, that would fit in on a theme of almost like on a seasonal theme. So at the beginning of the, the, the book, um, uh, we, we do a little bit of stuff on, on spring. And as you go through the book, uh, eventually, a lot of the poems towards the end of of, of the uh, of the anthology are dealing with wintry uh, wintry themes. So you, you can sort of narrow it down. So if people want a, co a copy of that book, then go to your website, dirigiblebloom.org, and it's on there in the shop, I think, on that website. And that's, uh, as I said, all proceeds that go to the National Literacy Trust, and it's a brilliant thing to have in your classroom. To give you a little taster of that, I'm going to hand over Jonathan now, who's got uh, two poems he's going to read uh, from that book. Uh, so, round of applause. Mr. Jonathan Humble uh, from the Dirigible Room with the Chasing Clouds after anthology and a little small taster for you. Here we go. Right. Well, the very first poem that's in the book is by uh, Julie Anna Douglas, and it's called How to Conjure a Poem in e Eight Easy Steps. One, take a magical pen carved from the bark of the ever bronze tree and forged in phoenix flames. Two, dip in the mystical ink of the deepest, darkest depths of the octopus ocean. Three, weave invisible parchment from delicate threads of moon dust, sunbeams, snowflakes, and unicorn tears. Four, sprinkle with the essence of luck from the pot of gold at the end of a triple rainbow. Five, travel by paper aeroplane to the lost island of Alonio and build yourself a writing hut from the leaves of the lesser spotted peekaboo plant. Six, contemplate for a century, dream for a decade, and wonder for a week. Seven, write in perfect time to the rhythm of a resting dragon's heartbeat. Eight, wrap your completed poem in cloud silk, spun by the seven silver singing sprite sisters of the southern skies, and post to the universe on a first class shooting star. That was by Julie Anna Douglas, wonderful poem. And then a little bit later on, we have another poem, uh, which is this time by uh, Michael Rosen. Uh, and Michael Rosen's poem is called The Suitcase Poem. And it's about a suitcase who's got a bit of a beef. And here it goes, The Suitcase Poem. I'm a suitcase in an attic all year. I'm a suitcase stuffed full of gear. I'm a suitcase crammed in a hold. I'm a suitcase freezing cold. Well, yes, I may be a suitcase, but I want to be free. I want to go to the beach and swim in the sea. I want to go to the mountains and learn how to ski. I want to hear music, dance and shout. You leave me in the room when you go out. But I don't want to be baggage. It's not what I want to be. I'm a suitcase and I want to be free. Next trip you take, you're in for a shock. I may be quiet, shut tight with a lock, but while you're out enjoying the sun, I'll escape. I'll be on the run. A suitcase on the move, looking for fun. I'll be that suitcase. Yes, that'll be me. I'm a suitcase who wants to be free. There That's we go. Fantastic stuff. So that's my by Michael Michael Royzen. Gives you kind of a flavour of, of of the stuff in in the book there. Uh, Jonathan, speak to your days as usual. Absolute pleasure to have you back on the show. Uh, book is available on digitalballoon.org. Do check that out. But for now, please put hands together and a big thank you to have back on the show, Jonathan Hamble. Please, thanks, Jonathan. Nice to speak to you again. Bye bye. Yeah. Okay, fantastic work there. And now, please welcome back. To Mr. Dilly Meets, Philip Reed, and Sarah McIntyre, back again. And we back together again. It's one, 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 one. How are you enjoying the show uh, so far? And it's lovely to have you uh, both on, as I said, but both on together as well. So we are here in, in the main to speak about your, your new collaboration, Adventure Mice, uh, mm -hmm. which is out uh, beginning of March. Uh, here we go. Hold it all up. Da -da -da. That's good. Yeah. Dan, dan, dan. Um, could you tell us a little bit more uh, about the about the book and this maybe the story and uh, mm -hmm. anything you want? So I'll hand over to you both, and you can decide who, who goes first. Yes, adventure mice. Well, um, basically, yes, it's a team of a team of bold and daring mice who uh, there's a whole the whole crowd of little mouse islands somewhere, 
uh, where mice live and pursue their micey lives. And of course, sometimes they get into trouble. There are shipwrecks and, you know, otters and seagulls and things attack them. And so that's when they call for the daring adventure mice, mm. who um, are a, a brave team of, uh, of mice who have boats and planes and helicopters and things at their disposal and they can zoom in and help save the day mm -hmm. so that's what it's all about basically and how do, how do you um you probably ask this a lot but in terms of your your actual working partnership but in, in terms of how did that first come about but then mm -hmm. how have you how do you sort of you did mention this a little bit earlier on but how do you sort of keep coming up with 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 ideas uh you know for for for, sort of for another book or another book series so how did it come about for, first of all that, that your partnership well, it started in lockdown because we were, um, you were way off in Dartmoor oh, and I lived in London <clears throat> and I had this collection of little ships um, that I'd get at the market for quite cheap uh, little boats. And I, since I didn't have any, we didn't have anywhere to go, I started painting pictures of these boats and then just for fun, I put little mice on them wearing sort of jumpers and um, people liked them. They started buying them, um, the original art, and then I started getting them printed as cards and I had little toy planes and stuff and I got those, I printed those and sold the artwork as well. And eventually um, people kept saying, well, they kept saying, you should turn this into a book. You should turn this into a book. And I thought, I would like to do that, but it'd be more fun with a friend. So I said, hey, Philip, would you do some books with me? And he said, of course. It's amazing, so, um, it's amazing what sprung out of lockdown, isn't it? You know, because it kind yeah. of like, it was, it was quite, it was like obviously an awful time and a really awful time for a lot of people. But it was also that time sort of, you know, the creative ideas that came about and people's uh, people's sort of resourcefulness it was it was amazing to see across the board really i thought mm -hmm. so your, yours was a uh, coming up with this whole new world together which is which is a, a fantastic thing um could you maybe uh are you going to both read from the book or going to one of you read and uh, well, so, do you do? okay, <laughs> okay so we're going to hear a little bit uh from the story of adventure mice and then after that we are we are back with the quiz which i know you're very excited about yeah. uh -huh. Well, the plan is to write lots of Adventure Mice books, and the first one is called Otter Chaos. And, well, as you can see, there's a large otter causing mm. trouble in the Mouse Islands, and the Adventure Mice are trying to get rid of him, trying to get him to run away. So they're going to try and scare him off by uh, firing a large firework rocket at him. Mm. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> I'm going to light the fuse, said Skipper. It's very important that everyone stands as far away as possible. Ivy and Millie did as they were told and ran to the far end of the ship, but Pedro stayed where he was, fascinated by the match that Skipper struck to light the rocket. How pretty the flame looked as Skipper stood on tiptoe to hold it to the fireworks' blue paper fuse. The fuse began to burn. Skipper tossed the match overboard and turned to run. He was startled to see Pedro still standing right behind him. Take cover, he shouted, and scampered away to shelter with the others. Pedro scampered with him, but he had not scampered far before something yanked him back. He looked round and saw that his tail had got tangled in one of the lengths of string which still trailed from the rocket. Pedro, hurry up, shouted the others. Sorry, said Pedro, and reached down to untangle his tail. But the string was hopelessly knotted around it. He glanced up nervously at the rocket. The fuse fizzed fiercely. Pedro squeaked in fright as he raced to untie himself. Too late. The rocket sneezed sparks and shot into the sky. Pedro shot after it. Ah! <laughs> he screamed as he went hurtling towards Mortlake the otter. The otter screamed too. He had been creeping along the headland towards the mouse town, planning to catch the mouselets as they crowded ashore. When the rocket came racing at him, he thought it was a thunderbolt. It whisked past his face close enough to singe his whiskers. Oh, he howled. He fled across the headland, flung himself into the waves and swam away from the Mouse Islands as fast as he could, vowing never to return. The rocket carried on, up and up, high into the sky above the deep water channel, with poor Pedro dangling behind it until it burst with a colossal bang! bang! Am I interrupting you carrying on? <laughs> Pedro, I, mean, no, no, I do apologize. I like the bang. I was going to. Okay. <laughs> okay, we can stop there. That's good. No, no, I, li I like the bang. You can carry on. It was really good. I like the, I like the bang bit. I love the the illustration with, with the writing. So, how do, how do you decide on um, what illustrations to, you know, to focus on uh, from the text? And how does it work? Do you provide the whole text first to Sarah? And how does that how does that work together in terms of? Um, well, we usually. Um... I mean, you know, in this one particularly, of course, a lot of it came from Sarah's drawings to start with. So, you know, she'd drawn 
particular ships and mice and you know the little yellow plane and one of these cards um you know obviously we needed that in there so i i we kind of wrote that into the story but we come up with the with the story together we sort of talk it through and we we talk about the characters and the sort of things that might happen to them um so we kind of come up with like a rough outline of what the story is going to be and then i go away and write it but i show it to sarah all the time you know I, after at the end of each day's work i'll I'll sort of email what i've done to sarah and then she yeah, can yeah. give in ideas and then philip helps me with the drawing because um it takes me ages to do the pencil rough versions yeah but when philip helps instead of taking two weeks it, when philip sits at the desk and does it with me it takes about a day and a half to do the pencil rough. It's, 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 fa it's fascinating. I, I think it's a really fascinating partnership as well you've got there as well. And obviously individually you do your own, own work as well, which, which is great to see. Now we're going to just move on to some other people's work as we uh, put some questions to you both for the... Uh, <laughs> so children, get ready for this. This could be, uh, this could be fantastic or, or a complete disaster. We're not really sure. But it'd be fun, whatever it would be. So in your classrooms, uh, you can play just by yourself. Uh, with a bit, you need a bit of a, a bit of paper and a pencil or pen in front of you, or you can go into uh, teams or into pairs, whatever you want to do. Um, we have eight questions, and they're all based on children's uh, books. Uh, some key stage one, some key stage two, uh, and they're quite simple answers, hopefully. Uh, and um, it's, Sarah and Philip are going to play uh, against each other. They usually work in partnership, but today they are <laughs> fierce opponents. Fierce opponents, I know. <laughs> So, um, first of all, I, I asked earlier um, if um, they had their own particular buzzer sound. Uh, so, shall I go to you first, Sarah? Do you have a particular buzzer sound? Uh, can I just do like hands? Like, woo -hoo -hoo -hoo, that's my hand. Oh, I like the with the sound. Yeah, with the sound. Try that with the. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mad duck sound. That's good. Okay. I'll do a higher one. <laughs> <laughs> Philip, Philip, do we have uh, a particular I'll, sound? I'll, I'll do a lower one. I'll just go, a wooga. <laughs> So here we go. So question one. So get ready in your classrooms to play along with this as well. And I suppose in your classroom, it's the first person with their hand in the air uh, uh, gets this as well. So here we go. <laughs> question one. What is the title of the Dr. Zeus book about a cool feline with stripy headgear? Oh, we did it at the same time. Oh, Sarah, yes. The cat in the hat. It is the cat in the hat. Well done. Well done. Well done. <laughs> Very, very well done. Okay, one point to Sarah. Philip, come on, I believe in you, but I think we're going to be okay. Okay, I say question two in our quiz inspired by adventure mice, of course, and animals and uh, adventure together. Question two. This is the last line I'll be saying of a book. It's a children's picture book, and it's the last line. Can you tell me uh, what the title of the book is, please? Okay, and uh, wait till I finish the actual line, of course. Here we go. So what book is this the last line of? The mouse found a nut and the nut was oh, good. God. Oh, yes, Philip. Oh, that's the Gruffalo. It is the Gruffalo. Well done, Philip. Well done, well done. Very, very good. Okay. Okay. So I hope you're doing well in your classrooms here. Uh, question three. This is a Roald Dahl question. So in Roald Dahl's James and the Giant Peach, what provided the power for the peach when it floated through the air? Oh. Is Sarah, that yes. I think it was pulled by geese, was it? Or something on ropes? It, was, it? it wasn't geese, though, but I'll hand oh. it over to, to, to Philip. It was bird. Is it pigeons? It wasn't pigeons. It wasn't pigeons. Any other guesses? I'll have to give you a... Oh, was it swans? No, it wasn't swans. It was, oh, in fact... Seagulls. 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 So, okay on that. It's okay with that. Okay, here we go. Question four. So we're halfway through after this question. Um... This is a last line question. It's a famous children's picture book. Once again, I get to the end of the line and then in classrooms and also Philip and Sarah, uh, it, then, you can, then you can guess. Okay, so which picture book? Is this the last line of, please? Then he nibbled a hole in the co cocoon, sorry. Then he nibbled a hole in the cocoon, pushed his way out, and he was a beautiful butterfly. Sarah. That is the hungry caterpillar. It is the hungry caterpillar. Right there, Sarah, the hungry caterpillar, fantastic there. So two points to Sarah, one point to Philip at the moment. Here we go. Uh, question five. And this is uh, an, an older, an older book. Um, in which Gillian Cross book, of course, uh, last month's uh, Mr. V meets guest. In which Gillian Cross book do Dina and her friends discover strange things about their new headmaster? Awuga. Yes. Um, the demon headmaster. Yeah. It is the demon headmaster. Well done, Philip. Well done. Well done. Okay, so two all now. Level pegging. Okay. 
But this one's quite hard on this. And so this is really just a, a wild guess because it's the best of three, uh, really. So question six is a question about bears. Three very famous bears, in fact. Paddington Bear, Winnie the Pooh and Rupert Bear. But the question is, and this is quite a hard one, which is the oldest? This is a hard one. So it's just a guess, really. Ooga. I yes. think it is Winnie the Pooh. Wrong answer, I'm afraid. I'll okay. say Paddington. Yeah, it must be Wrong answer, I'm afraid. Oh! No. Oh, I know, I can't give it. It is Rupert Bear. Rupert Bear is the oldest. He was created in 1920, really, but not. Winnie oh. the Pooh was first published in 1926, and Paddington Bear was in 1956. Oh, oh, I know, I know. It's a tricky one, that one. Okay. Question seven. Here we go. Question seven. I hope you enjoying this playing on your classrooms. Keep it together, people. Got two more to go. Okay. Which Richard Adams book about rabbits features? Woo, woo. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, both together? that might be both together at the same time, I think, really. It, so uh, you, you do the first word, Sarah, and Philip, you do the second word. What is it? Down. Well, uh, also my favorite book, and it, as a kid watching that cartoon, loved it. Can't think about it. Okay, so Watership Down, so point each for that one. Well done. And the last question of our, our children's book quiz inspired by Adventure Mice is uh, a film as well. Uh, on her way down the yellow brick road, who does Dorothy meet first? The Cowardly Lion, the Scarecrow, or the Tin Man? Ooh, yes. I think the Scarecrow. It is the Scarecrow, Sarah. <laughs> round of applause, round of applause. <laughs> which means... Pit by the price by one point of our of our competition, four points to three. The winner of our adventure mice competition, if you like, today is Sarah McIntyre. Oh, <laughs> but a round of applause, of course, for Philip Reeve as well. So well done, Philip. Well done, Philip. And it's an absolute pleasure to have you both on today. Thank you very much for being on Mr. Diddy Meeks. And very good luck with the, the book. If you don't need it, it's a, it's a wonderful book. And, and all your work as well. It's a pleasure to have you on. And uh, I look forward to speaking to you again. Please put our hands together. And a big thanks to Philip Reeve and the wonderful Sarah McIntyre. Thank you very much. Thank you to have you on. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Take care. So that was uh, Philip and Sarah there near the end of the show. Wonderful guests. So um, before we go, uh, just a quick reminder of uh, we have. Uh, our competition to win uh, your own signed copies of these books. And once again, uh, if you want to uh, have a go at that, get your get your artwork in uh, on those artwork challenges, both Philip and Sarah uh, set. The Dilly's Doodles Artwork Competition and uh, send to mrdillyprints at gmail.com by the 31st of March, please. And subject line, Dilly's Doodles. Um, we're nearly there at the end of the show. Um, I just said uh, at the beginning of the show um, that... Uh, Mr. Lee meets all the old ones are on YouTube. There's also history content on there for you to use in your in your classroom, specifically sort of key stage two stuff, all free uh, for you. Uh, teachers, if you do go on there, do uh, consider subscribing. It helps me kind of keep everything going uh, and also gets the show uh, seen by more people, of course. So that's uh, that's great. So just go on to YouTube, type in Mr. Dilly, and it's all uh, it's all all up there. Fantastic stuff. So uh, next uh, month on the show, who do we have? We have uh, celebrating or. Um, Earth Day, we have um, Natasha Farrant and Emma Carroll on the show with their, their new books. So uh, keep tuned for that. That'll be coming out the end of April itself. Uh, but for now, uh, it is my uh, my pleasure to say thank you very much for joining me on Mr. Diddy Meets again today. And it's goodbye from me, my friends. And it's goodbye from me. Goodbye, my friends. Goodbye. <laughs>